No, no, that's fine. We'll do it. So the attendees are just starting to come in, so we'll just give it a minute or so uh, before we start to give chance for everybody to finish their yoga or finish their break and come back into the session. Yeah, I did see yoga was on before us. I wish I could have done that, actually. <laughs> Great, we'll just give it a little bit longer. Okay. Where did you say you were based, Hayley? I'm based in the northwest, so near oh. Liverpool. Oh, near Liverpool. Great, I think we'll probably um, go ahead and get started. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm just looking at the attendees. Yeah, I think we'll go ahead and get started and then people will join uh, when they finish yoga or, or the break as well. So, um, welcome to everyone to this uh, Q&A session on um, behavior that, that challenges us on behavioral symptoms. Um, this is hosted by Gillian Foster, who I'll hand over to shortly to introduce herself. And we also have Kerry here, who's a, a young person who's going to share some of her experiences as well. Um, so thank you all for joining so far. And um, I'll hand over to um, Gillian and Kerry. If you want to ask any questions throughout, that's the idea of it to be an interactive session. So please ask your questions and that will be in the Q&A box. If you wish to, you can also press raise hand and then we can unmute you uh, for you to ask your question live if you prefer not to type. So I'll hand over to Gillian. Hello, everybody. Um, I also wish it was last me and we were all together. However, welcome to my kitchen in Fife. And in Scotland, I have to tell you, um, it's the first time ever I've done a meeting in my Baffies. So that means slippers elsewhere in the country. However, it's really comfortable. But thank you for inviting me. Um, I am really fortunate to work with a team of people in Fife. So for people that don't know Scotland, we are just over the bridge from Edinburgh. Um, we don't have a genetic center, um, but there is one in Edinburgh and one in Dundee. I work with another nurse, a consultant, and psychology. So we know we're very fortunate. We're part of Enroll and we're also part of Clarity. Um, we work with, although I'm employed by NHS Fife, I also work with Scottish Huntington's Association. Um, we have an age range from eight to, we've got a client currently in our 90s. The Scottish Huntington's Association also provide a financial wellbeing service and a youth service from eight to 24 year olds. I've titled the talk today, Behaviour That Challenges Us, because what I've found in my experience is sometimes the person with HD, it's not a problem to them, it's a problem to the carers, um, and that be family or people that work with them. And along with um, a psychologist I'm, I'm working with, we're developing a resource because I couldn't find a resource to help support carers while they're dealing with these complex behaviours. So um, hopefully that will be finished quite soon and it will be available to anybody that, that finds it very difficult. Um, I, had, I did ask Kerry um, to help me with this talk today because one of the reasons that this part come together was that people were given what's called notice to quit. So I don't know what that's called in other countries, but it means that 
they have to find another resource, another care facility, somewhere else that can manage their behaviour because really what they're saying is we cannot do this any longer. And it's really important that the person with HD who has become familiar with their routine and with their carers, that we don't then have to find another resource. Um, so that's why, why um, we were looking at that. So the aims of the session today are to hopefully provide a wee understanding of why these happen, to listen to Kerry and her experiences um, with her dad, to provide strategies that are going to help with the behaviour, and to signpost to resources to support these complex behaviours. The strategies I've provided, because I'm very aware through being very fortunate to attend a lot of conferences, that internationally we don't have the resources um, in other countries that we do have in Fife. So I'm hoping that this session gives you some tools to, that you can tell the carers and some knowledge and understanding for you to pass on and that helps your loved one at, in their care needs. So first of all, I wanted to just speak a wee bit about the brain. Um, so the part of the brain that's most affected is the caudate. And what the caudate does is sends the information and the messages to the frontal lobe. Um, and the frontal lobe is what's, what, what connects to our executive functioning. And this is the part that people can't see. So when I'm doing these training sessions and I'm doing them in care homes, I'll say to the staff, would you ask someone to walk who had no legs? And they'd say no. And I'll say, well, why ask my client to wait when they can't do that? So it's given this information to carers um, so that they can look after uh, you know, the loved ones in the best way they can. So these are some of the executive functioning that I'm going to talk about that are the, the ones that come up more, more often when I'm caring for clients. So 21 years now I've been doing this. I have so many case studies and examples and, all, and you almost think you've got the answer to everything and you don't because something new comes up. And I just had an example two weeks ago, a brand new behavior. Um, and every time it's a challenge, it's never easy. We've never always got the correct solution the first time, but hopefully we get there in the end. So the ones I'm going to talk about are apathy, planning and organizing, impulsivity, irritability and anger, denial and unawareness, and disinhibition are the ones that I, I thought are the most frequent ones that I come across. So apathy. Apathy often misread for laziness. Again, I had a good example last week where a wife phoned me thinking that, that her husband was depressed. I, did, uh, I was able to do a visit, even in COVID, we can't do visits if, it's, if there, there is a, a concern. Um, so apathy is inattention, lethargy, less concern for things often misread for depression, and in this case, absolutely was. I asked the man how he was, he was perfectly fine, he was sleeping well, he was eating well, he couldn't understand why there was such a concern. However, the wife was, was so anxious, I could feel it in the room, and because she was working, his care needs were increasing, and he was doing less in the house. So, when we go out to something like that, we're assessing the whole situation, the carer, the person, the environment, and often things to, to try are visual reminders. You, you're, you're often able to get small whiteboards that you could just write a message, for example, feed the dog. Because that was one of the things that um, the wife had a concern with because he used to walk and feed the dogs. So that could be set. Often to put the time as a good thing as well, two o'clock. A mobile alert on someone's phone or a text to the person just to prompt them because it's as prompting to do something. Again, to educate and understand that HD causes an inability to initiate a behavior. And also to make sure that the, what you're asking them to do isn't too complex, that they're able to organize themselves to 
be able to do that. Um, I have added medication because there are some medications that help. I'm not, there is a um, resource at the end to help with medication. I'm not a doctor um, and some person may, people who are prescribed medication will react to that medication better than others. So I think it's a very personal thing as well. Organisation, so that's the planning, planning sequencing and prioritising information. So this would be like, if you, if you take an example like making a meal, being able to go and buy whatever needs bought, then preparing that, cooking times, things like that. People might not be able to do that. A good example I had of this one was a lady who broke an arm and the ambulance was turning up at eight o'clock every morning. Well, not every morning, but had turned up several times to take her plaster, to pick her up, to take, remove her plaster. I had done a visit and there was a distinct smell in the house. I contacted to see when her plaster was due to be removed. And they told me the ambulance had turned up. Uh, it say it was eight o'clock in the morning. When I, when I spoke to the lady about this, she said, but I need to have my conflicts before I go anywhere. So being able to prioritise and see what's more important is diminished because of the impact on the core date. And this, and, and strategies to help with this, sometimes limiting the amount of information, allow for the slow process and speed. People are not able to formulate the response when asked a question. So it's a great skill to be able to ask a question in a very deliberate way, limiting choices and allowing people to formulate their answer. Keep to a regular routine, be consistent and structured routines make it easier to stay organized. When you've taken away part of the CODI, if you remember that a third of the brain is missing in post-mortem, then the, their ability to do this is not there. So the routine is key here. Whiteboards again, you also get sticky whiteboards where you can write up just Monday to Friday. Some people just can take one day at a time. Other people ma manage with a monthly calendar. Again, it's just depending on the individual. Impulsi impulsivity and disinhibition. So this is difficult to control the emotional response. The core date takes away, it cannot regulate how much feeling and thinking is required. So people lose their temper easy and this inability away is one of the biggest things. What I will say to people is, Never say, I'll be back in five minutes. We're no back in five minutes. Tell someone, because the personal HD will watch the clock. It's really important to them that it happens when it's said. Tell them you'll be back within the hour. Tell them it'll happen in the afternoon. Be realistic about the time frame and which you're going to carry out whatever it is they require. So again, identify triggers. It might be, it could be environmental or personal to the person. It might be too warm. They might not be able to communicate how they're feeling. Active listening. This is really important. With Kerry, and Kerry will tell her story. When I visited her dad on the ward, one of the nurses approached me and said, Gillian, um, Tom has said that he's going to trip me up. And we're quite worried because... So tripping up would be to put your leg out and let someone fall over and could sustain quite an injury. So when I went to speak to him and I asked him, do you mean tripping up as in putting your leg out and trip them up? Or did you mean trip them up as in I'll trip them up mentally? And he said, no, I'll be putting my leg out and I'll be tripping them up. And I said, why would you do that? Because they've not fixed my diet. It was, he had moved from one resource to another his diet had completely changed and they hadn't got it right. And because they hadn't got it right, he suffered, he had, he had diarrhea. And because he had diarrhea, then he thought he had been poisoned. So then he wasn't eating and he was losing weight. So the, it was about finding out why he was thinking because he wasn't able to say these things. 
his response was to do something. And he told me this, if I trip them up, then they'll sort my diet, they'll sort my food. And that's how affected his brain was. So active listening is really important and trying to, and that takes a lot of time. So when you've got someone who has a slow ability to formulate a response and find the correct words, then it's a skill. Remain in control and try not to escalate the situation. And again, routine is really important. One of the main ones is, is frustration, irritability and anger. And if I had the answers to the, all of this, it would be fantastic. However, we do plow through this, do you know, and it changes throughout disease. This tends to get less as disease progresses into later stages. Um, but however, we we'll all have this, we've all experienced frustration, irritability and anger. I find the, when speaking to clients, the sense of continual loss for them from loss in their job, they could lose their family, losing their speech, losing the ability to swallow, losing their house, losing their loved ones, losing their friends. It's a continual loss and it doesn't stop. And um, I would be frustrated, irritable and, uh, and angry. Strategies, signals, verbal and non-verbal. Again, just picking up on some of the, if there's facial expression um, that they have, maintain independence, being in control is really key. They have lost the ability to control their life. So given some of that back, I've, I've, I've seen that work really well. And again, tasks to be appropriate to level of function. No to be asking when I spoke earlier about a whiteboard, there's no point in asking someone to go out and cut the grass that can't start the lawnmower now, do you know, or falls over if they're cutting the grass. So we need to make sure the tasks are appropriate to the functioning. Denial and unawareness. Again, I see people with every symptom HD that tell me they do not have HD. They have a problem with their back or, or whatever they may say as the reason for. They are unaware of their movement or how they come across to you. Um, and it's an, it's an inability to cope with distress and circumstance, like bereavement. So if we go through bereavement ourselves, there is this denial, it's no happening, it's, it's no real, we don't want to acknowledge it. Um, no being able to recognize their own disabilities and their own behavior. And that's why I titled this behavior that challenges us because they are not aware of their behavior. They're not aware of their mistakes or being inappropriate. Strategies again, no best way to cope with this. It requires really creative thinking. And hopefully I could share some of that with you um, as, as one of the ones for denial and unawareness. Um, perseveration, again, this is getting stuck. Very commonly cigarettes, coffee and meal times are the three most common I have. What to do, and again, switching from one activity to another becomes very difficult. So what, what, what we call this is multitasking. People with HD do not multitask. We do it quite well. It's one thing at a time. So again, strategies are build into routine. So becoming stuck on a subject. The, the amount of times I went into a care home and nurses have told me, He's driving me crazy. He's asking for a cigarette all the time. I think one of, one of my most um, good examples of this and was a lady in her 60s in a care home. And they'd phone me up saying, you're going to have to find somewhere else. We can't cope with this. Everyone's upset. She's going into everyone's room and stealing the chocolate. So she was going into the other client's room and eating the chocolate. She loved chocolate. So when I went out... Obviously, they gave her a bar of chocolate in the morning. She'd eat all her chocolate and had none left. What we did there was we gave her a piece of chocolate every hour. But it's really important that that happens on the hour. She then stopped going into the rooms and taking other people's chocolate. 
So that was a solution. It works well for cigarettes as well. And meal times, often, they, do you know, I've had so a few clients who can't understand why they don't get served first. They want, if there's a care home with 30 people and they become number 10 that's served and that causes them anxiety and irritability, then I'll say to the staff, why don't you make them the first person to feed? And this is the reason why you need to do it. If they don't understand why they need to do it, there doesn't seem to be a reason why they need to do it. Humour and distraction is also quite helpful in perseveration. This is for at the end. It's just thank you for listening. I didn't want to do death by PowerPoint. Um, some of the, I've put my email address up there. hdscotland.org is a great website for information. So is the English one, the HDA and other organisations all have lots of information on behaviour. Our framework is a new resource that you can click on and, um, and Scotland will have this. So it doesn't just cover behaviour and symptoms, it covers um, having a test and, um, you know, being safe. Um, Understand Behaviour and HD is a great resource. Physician's Guide, if you're looking for medication to help um, with this. And Hurry Up and Wait by Jimmy Pollard. Love the book, great read. Um, and I want to hand over to Kerry for Kerry to tell her story um, with her regarding her dad. Kerry, you okay for? Yeah. Forward? Yeah. Um, it's more focusing on behaviour. Um, we experienced a, a lot of different behaviours over the last couple of months that were new to us. Um, we had no idea of what these behaviours, why they were caused, or it was just them deteriorating. Um, it all started with the psychosis and simply having a voice inside a skybox. Um, but this voice would tell him to do things, but he would always listen to it. Um, this had to result in us removing the skybox and the satellite dish from his room um, as for his own safety because it started to really get in his head and tell him to do other things. Um, and the other, with that same care home, it was more, everything had to be on time. There had to be that routine. You couldn't go five minutes early with, with his medication or five minutes late. It was a set time every single day and he would be waiting. Um, it did result in some aggressive behavior. Um, there was outbursts. Um, we had a few cases where there was assault towards members of staff, but trying to educate them that this routine must happen is hard in a care setting, having other, other people there as well. Um, they're not first priority. They don't understand why they're not the center of attention. The whole world should be around them. Um, it actually resulted in um, being sectioned and removed from that care home under the Mental Health Act. And he was put into a facility um, where it wasn't adequate for Huntington's, it was more centered on mental health and elderly. So putting somebody with Huntington's in there, there's no one with Huntington's experience, nobody knows what it was, there was no adequate diet, routine was a big thing, but in a mental health facility it's hard because you've got all these other people with mental health issues that don't think, oh, the guy over the room, oh, we can't interrupt his routine. Um, so we had a lot of issues food-wise and then medication, um, which then resulted in a more serious assault happening. Um, wasn't have like no excuses, no nothing. It is ill as illness. He doesn't know how to communicate apart from aggression or causing some injury to then get what he wants because then he's hurt. Um, he is now he's now been moved and he's in a a good home now. Um, is stable, he said they were pre-warned, routine is a must, because it was a learning curve for us as well, we weren't aware of the triggers or how bad he was time orientated um, but now that we're aware of it, we're able to make other people aware of it and you can't, you could say oh about two o'clock this is what happens it has to be two minutes like two o'clock, it can't be two minutes after, it can't be two minutes before, they will watch that clock until that time comes um, he has um, been charged and stuff, which 
telling him was a bit behavior wise wasn't really ideal he knows he done it he's full of aware of he done it but he done it for a reason it meds were at the wrong time he wanted them to understand that wasn't what happened um but routine like with huntington's is just a must um i don't know like other people um it affects differently but certainly with my dad with psychosis it is the number one priority um, it did have like an impact on mine and my sister's life because we have kind of taken control more of like power of attorney and stuff. Um, and especially myself, I have more mental health problems. But when it comes to that, my whole life went on hold. All my my own issues put aside because he can't help his own, so somebody has to step up and help it. But I have learned, especially over the last few months, it's okay to say you're not okay. It's okay to put that hand up and ask for that help. My main solution for all of it was pick up the phone and speak to Gillian, the SHA, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't know where to go, where to look. So we are lucky to have the support we have, but it did take a, a downward toll on us all. And it was just one thing after another, after another. But once we got them settled and got them comfortable, it was just a, a relief. Like they're settled, the home have listened, they understand that this is what happens and this is why it happens. It's, it's just trying to educate the other people on, it is different for every single person. Like the next person could walk in with Huntington's who doesn't have a kid in the world about time. But then you've got the one in the next room where it has to be at a set time. Um, so I had another issue when he was sectioned. Um, the police, he was removed by police um, who are unaware of the illness, like a lot of people are. Um, and he was actually still put in handcuffs in the back of a police van, which resulted in bruising and cuts around his wrist due to the movements. But at the time, they just seen, let's remove the, the problem, which then did result in some harm towards him. But yeah, it's, it is all routine. It is you have to be focused on their triggers, what helps them. And it's different for everyone. Some people do, some people don't. But I'd say the psychosis, I hadn't really heard much about it through, but like with the Huntington's, like you don't hear much people saying, oh, it's psychosis. I expected, okay, my dad's not gonna be able to go for a walk down the street. He's not gonna be able to go to the shop. I expected movement. I didn't expect this total, different person to appear in front of me because he isn't my dad now like he's physically my dad he's still the same person but mentally that is not the man that I grew up with and it's just accepting it and trying to take the good with the bad you get a good day take that every day and um, like we used to get he used to have a phone and you get bombarded with messages all day every day but then you'd get that one wee message, it's just simple, I love you. And you did, you had to take that and just realise that that person is still there. It's just hidden by an illness that nobody can help or do much for. So yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kerry. I think um, when her dad had the phone, I think I was sacked about 12 times. He used to just text me and tell me I was sacked um, from my job. But he did then reinstate me again. But that was part of the control, you know. I think it, what was also very difficult for Kerry in this situation was we are really lucky that because we have psychologists, we are able to do cognitive assessments on clients. So we could see where the deficits are, the significant deficits. And then we're able to go out and do trainings or in that area so is that the 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 girls that work with the client are then able to realize how impaired this person is and that does help um it's a big resource and that's why we're developing the park because we didn't have the physical time to do it but Kerry's dad also had OCD and in, in the mix as well um one of the issues again was the towels so if he didn't get exactly I think it was a face towel, a hand towel, a bath towel. Every day these were delivered. 
And if one was short, then we had a behavior. So the solution to that was we purchased two full sets and the color he chose and made sure that all staff were aware that these weren't, do you know, all the towels weren't laundered and he might have got the man next door's laundered towels. So it was very important to him. And that stopped the behaviors around the towels. That was that problem solved. But just now we've not had any behaviors now for, we're coming up, I think for almost six weeks mm -hmm. in his new care facility. They've, we did two sessions of training to capture all the staff before he went in because it was so important to get this right. He had moved from his care home that he'd been in for, a, for two, three years it, because he had been in one before that as well. Um, in a acute psychiatry ward and the, when it was really bad with COVID, so they had cut the beds, but because they had cut the beds, they were only really taking the most ill people. So the ward was really, really noisy with, with you know, so that triggered behaviors from him. When we looked at that environment and we had to look at it and say, okay, where within mental health, where can we go? We were very lucky again that the mental health consultants looked at an IPCU, which is an intensive psychiatric unit, but we have quite a new build within Fife and it's really roomy and they were they were excellent in that normally they lock the bedroom doors during the day so as that their clients don't go back to bed and stay all day in bed. They took that away for our client because our client stays in his room all day and controls his environment within his space. Um, so they were very accommodating and they, it was their first experience HD and they were sorry to see him go at the end of the day, but he couldn't stay in an IPCU bed. Luckily, we were able to identify a resource that were willing to work with him as long as there was training and support following his admission to that unit. So it's a happy story for now. No, thank you, Gillian. That's that's really interesting. I just wondered, um, obviously it's fantastic to hear about your experience with the different units. I wondered maybe um, for other people on the line, if they're in a different country, um, obviously the Scottish Huntington's Association is fantastic. Where would be their first point of call if maybe they're on that cusp of not being able to maybe manage someone's behaviours at home and who should they reach out to? I, I, I think it would depend, Hayley, where they were. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have an association, do you know? But I think even because we, there's there's a lot of information on Enroll, HDO, do you know, if they, even if they come through HDO, they can signpost them. Yeah. If I know our organisation would no be saying, we're not giving the information to, their, their ethos is all about, families and people. We are really fortunate that not only do we have the person with HD, we have clients who are positive tests, no symptoms. We have carers, we have carers conferences, we have family conferences. And I know we have the youth service, as I said, and the financial wellbeing was identified three years ago because we did, uh, um, there was an exercise done and because the clients had become so familiar with me, we identified that some of them didn't want to say they were in financial problems, which again can cause a behavior. Do you know, so being able to have these resources is fantastic. I think in other countries, look at these other websites. There's, there's a lot of behavior information and I'm, I'm hoping, do you know, that if there is, I'm not aware of a resource park for these challenging behaviors because in my opinion, it's the most difficult symptom to manage. And they're so varied. They're so varied in the individual. And the case studies, I had the one last week, it was, it was so sad because it's a lady on her own in her 40s. And she had, the, the manager of the care home had phoned me up and said, we can't let this continue. She's bought a wedding dress, shoes, underwear um, for her wedding day and believe she's going to get married to this man that wasn't going to happen. So I had went out to see her and, and right enough, she was, she was actually parked ready to go and no one was coming to pick her up. 
Um, but she she had bought she had bought jewelry, um, a veil, everything for her. Desperately want to show me. Desperately want to show me a ring. She then gave me her phone because I said, "When is this? Do you know it was it was a fantasy? It was a need to be loved. She just wanted to be loved." COVID restrictions had stopped in the care home and people were getting visitors again. She doesn't have any visitors. There's no one to visit her. And when I went back her phone, I went back a year and the man who had been previously had never texted her for a year. She'd continued to text this whole time and waiting on a response. And I thought, how hard was that for, do you know? And we just sat down, we had a chat Ah, uh, you just know the, me, the, the reality of the situation and being able to empathise with her and listen to her, but her strong desire to be married and to be loved. Um, but we put the focus back on her because the other thing she likes to do is she likes her appearance. She takes a lot of care in her appearance, straightening her hair, her, her clothing. Um, so... I managed, again, we're really fortunate. We've got a family branch that raises money just for people with HD that we could tap into. And I had noticed her hair straighteners were broken. So I managed to go on Amazon, get her a decent pair of hair straighteners, and she's moved. Her wedding dress is hung up. I've parked it all away. She's quite happy. She feels she's taking control and stopping the relationship. She hasn't. The man has done it. But she believes... Because I'd say to her, would it not be nice for you to take control over this? And you decide, do you know, if someone's not communicating with you for this period of time, what would that, what would you be saying to me? And sometimes that's even difficult for some WHD. She was able to tell me what she would do if it was the other way, but not always is that person going to be able to do that. Um, but that was, that was one just, just quite recently, actually. No, that's a really interesting point because we hear um, quite often, you know, depending on the se severity of the um, the thought or, or the thing they think is maybe going to happen, we hear some family members say they'll just kind of go along with it if it's, if it's you know, harmless mm -hmm. and people don't know whether that's better or not. I guess, what would your advice be? I guess it depends how serious the thing is. As, do you know when the nurse, the, 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 manager of the care home phoned me up and I said is she happy and she went she's really happy I said so why would we no be want her to be happy do you know it's uh, she, and she was so proud because her wedding dress was something like 40 pound off the internet do you know so it wasn't a huge sums of money at all um but she was really happy and I think take giving her back the control but it is about this active listening and being really creative and sometimes that might not have worked what happened last week with someone else. They might have continued these text messages and continued to arrange this wedding that was not going to happen. Um, however, on this occasion, it did. If that hadn't, then we would need to look at someone else. And often sitting down with, we have the team. Do I'm, Again, I'm lucky that I work with a team to look at what other strategies we can try and see if, if that would work. But as I say, my client was happy. And by our taking control she's still happy and she's got a new trainer so i'm happy no definitely so we've had a few questions come through that i'll read out if that's okay so the sure. first one was um i think this is this person's experience but they've said how do you deal with a dad who's sick but does not want to get tested or get help and who doesn't want to speak about huntington's how, how can that this person help them okay I think I would probably, do you need to mention the word Huntington's? So I would take that out. Obviously, that's a trigger to him. So he doesn't want to acknowledge that. It's this denial and unawareness. So just, I think perhaps, depending again, you'll know your dad the best. Try and address what the issue is. So as the issue is behaviour, as the issue I'm falling, as the issue I'm choking, do you know and say, Dad, have you noticed this happening? Or ha Again, they might not, so you'll get some kind of sense of, of where they are, do you know what their understanding is? Um, 
but I would I, I wouldn't force that. I would not force you. You're probably going to have more confrontation by forcing it. And just maybe in general, if it pops up in his conversation, I don't know the, the communication ability of this person. Do you know, are they able to communicate with you? Um, it's harder when they're not able to communicate with you um, or it's very slowed or difficult. But I think in whatever the problem is, um, but it is, it is so, again, it's so challenging when people don't acknowledge what the problem is and you're having to deal and pick up the pieces from this. I think it's hard to answer, do you know, when I don't know, but it would, I would keep Huntington's, the word Huntington's at the conversation at all. Do you know, some of my clients, they, they call me the insurance lady. I'm not the Huntington's nurse. Because again, it's a Huntington's, do you know? So here comes the insurance lady. I'm like, call me whatever you want. Dinny, the word, the word sometimes is know what they want to hear. Um, and, we, and we didn't have to label it. Do you know, let's just address what the difficulties are. And if we can subtly try and help, sometimes without even them knowing, you might be able to do something without them knowing. So if it's problems with a swallow, are you able to bring something that might be more, do you know, a better consistency than what is maybe taken? Um, but I hope that answers your question. If you want to um, email me or get in touch more specifically, I don't mind. No, that's great. Thank you, Gillian. Um, the next question is, um, well, I think, I think you covered some of this as well, but I think to say, how does the environment contribute to behavioral difficulties in HD? And how can individual factors contribute to HD behavioral status? Okay, so the first part of that question, environment, I did miss some things because um, one of the things I've, I, I definitely did miss was about how noisy an environment can be. That could be a trigger for a lot of people. Um, I've almost wanted to build a wee island in Scotland just for people with HD. They could live on their own wee island. Um, particularly if you've got, we have a lot of houses that are upstairs and downstairs. So if a person with HD has upstairs neighbours and they're noisy, that could really contribute to problems. So noise, people, too many people, too hot, too cold. Um, so again, what kind of environment? We all, we all live in different environments. Some people like to be on their own. Some people like to be involved and, and with other people. Some people like to talk. Some people like to stay quiet. Do you know, so the, the environment I found to be a trigger and it's a diff difficult one to regulate if it's something you can't change very quickly. Like if you're downstairs for noisy neighbors, do you know, that's not something we could solve very very quickly Haley, could you just repeat the second part of that question yeah. the second part was how can individual factors contribute to hd behavioral status so would that be how individual factors am i reading this correctly like perhaps like urine urine infections is that what i'm not, um, sure. I'm not sure um if this person wants so, to clarify that might be helpful but i think it was yeah, I'm, um, I'm i'm thinking it's maybe physical things do you know, so how can physical things, so that might be pain. Do you know, if someone's in pain and can't communicate they're in pain, could contribute to behavior. Um, again, UTIs, that, that has been, I think UTIs and chest infection are, are up there on the list. The amount of times I have had people agitated and irritable, and it's been an infection that's been the cause of that behavior. Um, yeah. No, that's a that's a good point to always check for that as well and not just yeah. maybe just presume it's you know just the hd or whatever it is there could be something else to to check for that person um we have another question here um that says uh thank you so much uh carrie and jillian so grateful to you for sharing um if you don't mind saying carrie or maybe jillian can speak as well how did uh, your dad's behaviour impact on, on yourself, which you touched on, but also the rest of your family, if you don't mind answering that? Um, I mean, mainly, mainly me and my sister that deal solely with my dad as he made my mum take a step back and move on with her life and stuff. So it's solely me and my sister dealing with day-to-day -day life. Um, I mean, when behaviour started to take a turn, I managed to just kind of go numb to it. So I didn't feel 
or I didn't have a down day. It was more just get your head down, get it sorted. Once he's okay, it'll be okay. Um, we did kind of, he become the centre of the li- our lives. Um, it was, right, okay, next step, next step. Um, although, like, he made my mum take a step back, it does impact her an off very, very much so. There's nothing she can do because he won't allow her in the home, etc. So the most she can do is be there for us. So she's kind of who we bounce everything off of. Um, and we're new to, like, all the power of attorney and all the more legal stuff. So she like, is there constantly, but it does affect us all, um, all kind of differently. We are, a few years ago, if you had asked me how it would affect me, I would have just been this angry little little person that just didn't want to talk, didn't share anything, would never ask for help. Um, I just kind of got my head down, got on with it. I know like, at the back of my head, it was always there, but it was put that face on and get on with it. It is hard, it is challenging, but asking for help, was one of the best things that I could have done because it gave us a path. It gave us somewhere, like it gave us a way forward, the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and it, it, is, it is tough, like it doesn't just affect them. The, my dad probably isn't aware of how majority behavior he has. Mm-hmm. It's us that are noticing him slowly getting worse and being like, right, this is another impact. This is another, he's worsening. What do we do next? How do we? manage it without trying to change everything in his life because we finally got him stable so it's trying not to change too much but also trying to manage that behavioral issue no thank you thank you Kerry that's that's really helpful um and I think um if you don't mind me asking as well I mean you don't have to go in, into detail obviously but I think we've heard from some of the sessions as well how um you know, we've helped head and caregiving, it's important to take care of yourself as well. And I know you said you'd put some of that on hold. Um, but was, is there any particular tools that you found useful for you? Or, you know, that's still a work in progress or only if you want to want to share? Um, I've, I've suffered from like mental health problems for a lot of years. I mean, we were very young when we found out about Huntington's in the family, 2003. So I was only seven when it was introduced into the family. So it was never new to us, but when my gran passed away in 2007, it was only shortly after that my dad became symptomatic and it was the depression anxiety hit. And for years, I could never, ever get it under control. It was medication. It was the only way to feel better. I couldn't see a way out. I'm now years down the line, um, off all medication, um, but there is always still that chance of that one thing that could happen that triggers it all. But it's, my coping mechanism was talking. I never spoke the whole time from really us finding out. Most I spoke was, oh yeah, this is this is what's happening now. That was it. I never spoke about feelings wise. But talking has opened a lot more doors. It's you're wanting the help. You're wanting somebody to be like, right, okay, let, let's think about the next step. Where if you don't talk and you aren't open to other people, not opinions, but where to go next. That is the toughest bit because when I finally admitted that I needed help, I felt like I was letting him down because I wasn't able to solely concentrate on him and put his needs first. But then if you're not looking after yourself, you're not going to be able to do much for them. That's the way I kind of seen it. Because if I was struggling and had a bad day, I wouldn't go and visit. But then he was fixated on that visit's coming up. So it was it kind of kept creating more issues if I never looked after myself. No, I think that's um, that's really helpful to hear, Kerry, because I know uh, some people maybe aren't ready yet, but I think that's good to know that if you feel um, able to get help, you know, that's that's good from your experience that you've been able to do that. And I just say uh, at this point again, you know, um, the local associations and HDO, obviously you can always reach out to and we'll signpost you. Sorry, Gillian, did you want to say something? I just wanted to um, add in one of the things that was, um, I don't think I mentioned was, again, due to the, the, the caudate and the, and the problems within the brain, um, the mental inflexibility. So when, again, when I'm doing teaching and training, it's, do you know, people could be as stubborn as a mule, but it's this inability to see things from other um, people's points of view 
or be able to change the, their thinking. Um, and one of the things I picked up when he was in the ward, there was an incident with a nurse um, where, again, we managed to, um, what I, I hadn't realised was, Every meal time, and he told me there would be a different member of staff coming in with something to eat. So you've got a breakfast, a lunch, a tea, and a supper. So you've got four different people every day, all bringing in food in a different way. So one person might put it in one place, another, and it could be down to, do you know what they're saying and where this food is going? And we managed to regulate that, minimise the staff. Uh, to say the same thing and put it in the same place, we didn't get the behaviours after that because he couldn't cope with that, do you know, and having all this change and, and difference. So Kerry's dad really has this rigidity in his thinking of how things should should be. Um, and when after the, the, uh, the assault on the nurse happened, one of the things that I picked up from staff was... They said to me, is there's no remorse, there's no guilt, there's no, he doesn't feel anything. So if you think of, if you know a person that doesn't feel remorse or guilt, you make an opinion about that person. I then informed them he's not able to feel remorse or guilt or sorry because that part's broken now. So their understanding then changed and their opinion then changed just by knowing he was unable to do the things that they saw as, if this incident happens, then you would think he would say sorry or feel, you know, um, embarrassed. He's not able to have these feelings now. Just to add that wee bit in that I didn't see earlier. No, no, that's great. Thank you, Gillian. Um, we had a, another question um, that says um, this person's sister craves attention and gets furious every time she doesn't get it. So this person's asking, how can I not trigger her whilst also respecting my own space and boundaries? So, so I'm taking this as a person who is wanting attention all the time Was that question. She's yeah, attention. creates attention and she gets angry when she doesn't get it. But I guess this person um, wants to try not to trigger her, but also needs to, you know, also not give her the attention all the time as well. Right. Okay. Is there any way, again, I would go to a routine and a structure for a day. Is there any way, I mean, I don't know if this person's in care or at home. Is there any way that you can take certain times within the day to give her this one-to-one -one attention that she desires so that limits it to say I'm just I'm just pulling this out because I don't I don't know the circumstances so say this person is at home and you put on you get the the wee white boards you could also get sticky white um it's like a cellophane that you could write on so we managed to get that in um uh, Kerry's dad's room so I'd put it when he was on the um, when he was on the ward because we couldn't hang anything up or we could, you, you can't change that environment. An acute psychiatric ward, uh, uh, you're very limited to what you can do. So we found sticky bark and we wrote down exactly when things were going to happen. So when I would go to the ward, do you know when my visit would be to the ward? So what I would suggest is getting this sticky bark. Say you were able to give her half an hour in the morning so for 10 to 10.30, but we want it one time. Another session in the afternoon, maybe an hour. I, I don't know what, do you know if this person has the time, doesn't have the time, but I would certainly provide a structure and a routine to her day so she knew this time that she strives for this attention and needs this is going to happen at these times. Again, it's hard to be realistic about, even if it's 10 minutes of attention, do you know, 15 minutes, it doesn't have to be half an hour or an hour. If you could put these re regular parts in, that will become built into a structure and a routine. And hopefully, it might take a wee bit of time. It's not going to happen overnight. But if you keep referring back to the board, so you can say, see there, at one o'clock, I'm going to come back and we're going to, whatever it is you need to do. Yeah, that's really Hopefully good that might help. No, definitely. Um, we had another question, maybe this is for um, 
earlier symptomatic, so maybe um, quite early, early stages. Um, we have um, a question around uh, stubbornness and how we can um, maybe not reason with that person if that's if we're not able to do that. But how can we um, again, maybe that's sometimes we discussed before about changing our thinking um, because we're able to, to maybe uh, others are maybe able to rationalize that. But what would your advice be for maybe somebody who's quite stubborn? stubborn. To, mm -hmm. Oh. Do you know this? This one, this one doesn't take one conversation. Uh, that's that's the one thing. I think maybe one recently I had where I had a man. I don't know if it's stubbornness or tightness. It's a Scottish gentleman who doesn't want to spend money. Um, so the problem there was again it was the wife doing all the cleaning and he was making more and more of a mess. Um, so by by explaining to him what his benefits were for because mm -hmm. he didn't understand that in Scotland we have PIP or DLA, so they have a mobility component and a carer's component and you are getting money to provide care to that person. Yes, so, that's like a state allowance or a government. Yeah, yeah. so I don't know how it works in other countries, but he was being unable to do anything himself wasn't going to be spending any money before I got there. Once I explained to him, then he agreed to pay for a cleaner. But that wasn't one conversation. Do you know, it wasn't one conversation. It's, and it's hard to move people. If they're very fixed in their thinking, it's, it's no, you're not going to change things very easily. Do you know, and, and being stubborn, we could be stubborn. I've got a very stubborn daughter. And she's still stubborn and she's going to be stubborn next year. Do you know? But it, it, it really depends what the issue is about. Um, people have a personality as well. And I think sometimes it's exacerbated in HD. Do you know? So if pre-symptomatic, you've been quite stubborn, it's going to be very difficult and disease to move from that. But... I think don't stop trying, do you know, and be very gentle and subtle. Don't confront people, do you know, because it just makes things escalate and you didn't want to escalate a situation. Sometimes again, to think about, is this really important? Whatever, do you know, he's been stubborn about. So if, it's, if he's been stubborn about, I'm not thinking this for a minute, eating vegetables, do you know, do we, really need to eat as much veg do you know so it's about what the issue is he's been stubborn about um whereas if he's been stubborn about no attending an appointment that he really needs to attend then then that's an issue do you know so and we'd need i think i'm the, one thing that I, I do notice is i'm very fortunate and that i've stayed on this journey so i've had kerry's dad now for 14 years so I stay on the 18. Yeah. Um, so I've I've stayed on this journey for a long time. So I've developed a trust, you know, a, quite a trust relationship with these people. Um, and that I, I think that's really helped my situation. So we've we've went through the journey, we've overcome something they might have forgotten about, you know, so I'm able to say that wasn't quite what happened, do you remember? Do you know, so being with somebody over that period helps me as well to move on, but stubbornness is very difficult. Um, I will have a look for that person and see if there's any more literature anywhere. No, that, that's great. Um, and I think what a, a lot of what you've both said as well as to, um, you know, when we're talking about stubbornness, I mean, where, you know, I'm stubborn, you know, we're, we're all um, stubborn as well. And it's trying to yeah, mm -hmm. balance that with what's what's really important. Uh, and again, and it might be not get frustrated as well. Yeah. And it might be this inflexibility and being able to change their thinking. Do you know, as I said earlier, I'm really lucky to be able to have to be able to have a psychologist who could go in do a cognitive assessment and then present the findings and we can work from that, you know, to, to help um, overcome some of these behaviours that we see.
No, definitely. Um, so we're actually coming to the um, near the end of the session now. So that hour went so fast. So um, thank you both so much, uh, Gillian and Kerry. Is there any, um, we didn't have any more questions, but is there any last things you wanted to say at all or anything we missed? Um, I don't think so. Kerry, did you want to add anything at all? I don't think so, no. Just, I think just to... feel like never feel ashamed or embarrassed or anything to ask for help because the benefits you get back from it are so much better than not asking. Mm -hmm. And I think to remember, do you know, things will move on. You won't always be in this place. I've seen so much distress and heart and pain and happiness, do you know, but it will change. Sometimes it, it needs to go to crisis to change. Do you know, that's not what we want, but sometimes it's unavoidable that we have people being sectioned. I think in Kerry's situation, there were cognitive changes happening with her dad that weren't picked up on by, by the resource. Do you know, that they weren't able to put in it escalated. However, um, that's, just, that's just a theory. Um, and again, things change in disease. So as disease progresses, you get more apathy and less initiative and less motivation. And, um, but then you have, as, as you have less irritability and aggression as, as it moves on. I think the one thing I didn't mention was about someone's appearance. Um, so they lose the ability to self-regulate how they look. And it becomes very difficult to dress and undress just to be aware of that. Um, I had another situation where I had a man who refused to put clothing on, so he was nursed naked. Um, and again, we had to adapt the environment, so we had to build up the window so they could only be seen from his head up. But he was very able to communicate that it was, it was so every time he ate or drank, he would spill. Mm -hmm. He didn't want any disability aids, so he wouldn't wear them. So it was easier for him to use his towel to wipe his body than it was to put a... Uh, uh. But we, again, that was, that was so hard to manage. And one of the things that was really important there was supporting the carers because they were distressed. He wasn't distressed mm -hmm. as in, he was quite happy. He wasn't having to wear clothes, but the people looking after him felt they weren't doing a job properly because they weren't putting clothes on him. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we managed that one again, eventually got to a good place. No, that's fantastic. Okay. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that as well. Um, so we've had lots of comments that just said thank you to both of you. And thank you, Kerry, um, you know, being um, able to share your story. I think it's really uh, resonated with a lot of people in the chat. So thank you both. Um, so we now have uh, a 15 minute break. Um, and following this, we'll have um, Kathy, who's sharing her experiences of HD on track one. And on track two, we have a session about participating in, in HD research. So just want to say a huge thank you for Gillian and Kerry for joining us so late in the day as well. Um, but thank you both so much. And thank you to all the attendees for attending. And we hope that was really useful. Thank you. So I'm goodbye. Everybody. Bye bye from bye. Scotland and my bathies. <laughs> Bye, Bye. <guys. laughs>